All right, this is the History of Iran video, the making of the modern state, so video one. This will be for the quiz, which is on Thursday, and it will be open note. So part one, making of the modern state. So why do we study Iran? We talked about this today. Um, it's the world's only theocratic republic, and of course, that word republic um, is a little bit debatable because there are so many ways that the republic is limited and um, where the characteristics of democracy are limited or challenged. So it's really a theocracy with some democratic elements. And it's very unique among Middle Eastern countries for a variety of reasons. Uh, we see here a challenge between um, tradition versus modernization, and that has really characterized um, Iran's history, um, is this debate between modern values and traditional values, or conservatism versus progressivism. Um, Iran, interestingly enough, among many Middle Eastern countries, is actually considered to be a little bit more on the progressive side, although um, it's certainly not progressive by, you know, United States standards. As always, we talk about geography um, when we talk about a country. So historically, Iran has been vulnerable to invaders because of its location. So um, we're not going to get into a lot of specific, you know, invasions or what that's looked like. But um, early in its history, there were several tribes that invaded and took over and occupied Iran. And that's where Iran gets its um, Muslim uh, background. Much of the territory is inhospitable to agriculture. Um, when we talk about the size of Iran, um, Iran is slightly larger than Alaska. It's much larger than its immediate neighbors, as you can see. Uh, it is the world's second largest oil producer and the fourth, sorry, second largest in the region and the fourth largest in the world. Oil has been incredibly popular and something that tends to come up on the AP test is this idea that of the danger of being a one product country. It's very dangerous to rely only on one product because if that market would struggle or, you know, if they would um, face any serious issues in that, uh, it would hurt their entire economy. So oil is very, very important. Um, Iran is urbanized. It's partly industrialized. So about 68% of people in Iran live in urban centers and 70% of the labor force is employed in industry and other related services. Population is really, again, important, and maybe this is an area where we have some um, misconceptions about the population. So uh, when we talk about population density, 67% of the population lives on 27% of the land. Um, something that, again, a misconception, Iran is Persian, not Arab, and there's a difference. And so what that means um, is that there's some differences in, in the type of language that's spoken. If you look over here at languages, the most commonly spoken language is Farsi or Persian in English um, and not Arabic, as some people might believe. Okay. So 89% of the population is Shia or Shiite Muslim. So this is different from most of um, the Muslim population. Most of the Muslim population is Sunni Muslim, um, but Iran has a concentration of Shia or Shiite Muslims. So you can kind of see that breakdown here um, of the, of the uh, breakdown of uh, religions. And so there are some other religions um, living in Iran, but again, these people are, you know, going to be, um, you know, maybe persecuted or they're certainly not going to have the same political rights. I, uh, oh, and there's the last point, 58% of the population speaks Farsi or Persian. The population is super, super important. This is something that I would be um, expecting to see on the AP test. Iran is very young. 24% of all Iranians are under 15. 27 is the median age. That's up a little bit from recent years when it was 23. So of all the six countries that we study, let me close the door. Of all the six countries that we study, Iran has the youngest population. Um, some of this goes back to the Iranian Revolution. Shortly after the Iranian Revolution of 1979, the government actually encouraged births. They encouraged people to have children. Um, 
and a lot of that was about producing soldiers. And um, so, and there's still, there was a short reversal in that policy where they were sort of, you know, noticing that the population was spiking very quickly, and they tried to put an end to the population growth, but now they've reversed that and they're still encouraging large families. The government, though, is made up of mostly people from the older generation. This is a comparison of population pyramids between Iran and the UK. So Iran in 2008 versus the UK in 2008. So you can notice some trends here where Iran has this spike among young people from 15 until, you know, early 30s that really, um, for both genders. Whereas UK, um, we see more of that kind of middle age population and elderly. We see, a, you know, a higher proportion of people in the retired years. So this is why UK is facing some real dilemmas in terms of supporting people, especially with the National Health Service. Some basic breakdowns between Sunni versus Shiite. And you're not going to really need to know these on the AP test, but to give you some historical context here, um, I'll just, you know, hopefully you can pause the video and then you can, you know, take this down or take a screenshot or whatever you need to do. The biggest difference is about um, how people believed um, the leadership should work uh, for the religion. So people who are Shiite Muslim believe that all leadership um, in the Islamic faith should be based on bloodlines directly to Muhammad. Um, whereas Sunnis believe that the most prominent members of the community can select a new leader. So you can see some of the other, um, you know, some of the other pieces of information here. As I mentioned, you know, Shiite Muslims are the majority in Iran, um, but most countries have a populate, have a, a Sunni uh, majority. So again, I will just kind of let you on your own, you know, take a screenshot of that or, or write it down. All right, so the history, we're, we're skipping some of the history, you know, that comes really early in Iran's history. Like I said, there were some tribes, there are two, two pretty prominent tribes that invaded Iran and ruled it for many centuries, and they introduced and forced um, Islam on the people living there. So we're going to start with the introduction of democracy, um, and that came about from a revolution that existed from 1905 to 1909. And the earliest constitution came about in 1906. It involved direct elections, separation of powers, laws with an elected legislature. Um, it was a very strong legislature. Uh, it involved popular sovereignty, so people having a voice, people being able to vote, uh, majority rule. It included a Bill of Rights. Um, it did still retain Shiism as an official religion, so that didn't go away. Um, and it also created the Guardian Council. So the Guardian Council goes all the way back to this original revolution, and its power has only grown over time. At the time when this was adopted, um, there were, when we had this constitutional revolution, uh, this was a revolution where the merchants and local industrialists were demanding their rights be written out. And there was a king at the time called the Shah, and he agreed, and the, thus the constitution was created. All right, so in um, 1921, um, a military officer named Reza Shah carried out a coup d'etat. And he abolished the dynasty that was in place. So when I talk about this constitutional revolution, this is not, this is like a bloodless revolution, right? This is not fighting. This is simply that the local, you know, merchants were demanding a constitution and the king, left over from these dynasties, said, you know, agreed. Well, in 1921, we saw the beginnings of what were going to be violent revolutions. So Reza Shah carried out a coup d'etat and named himself the Shah in Shah, or the King of Kings. And he ruled with an iron fist. He it was a, um, a very strict society. He's the one who changed the name of the country from Persia to Iran. And um, he, you know, there were a lot of things that he did. He did industrialize the country. He built national railroads. He built modern factories. Uh, he took land away from the elites. 
Um, he also uh, started to sort of change the religious component of Iran. So um, he took away the law that said that women had to wear veils. He closed religious schools. So he was sort of getting rid of a lot of the, um, you know, influences of Islam in the country. In 1941, he was forced to abdicate his position because he did ally himself with the Nazis during uh, World War, I'm sorry, during World War II. Um, and he had to, um, therefore, abdicate his power once it became clear that, you know, the Nazis were eventually not going to win the war. So the Allied forces then, once the Allied forces were victorious in World War II, they recognized his son, Mohammad Reza Shah, um, as the new leader, and he took power in 1941. He continued to centralize power, um, so he really um, continued kind of that authoritarian rule. Um, he created something called an interior ministry that appointed all the governors of local regions. Um, they appointed town mayors. They appointed people who ran the villages, and that was all under his control. He also worked on building up the military, the military, and he formed this secret police association. And what it did was, it was extremely harsh. So it would, um, this, these police would arrest and torture and kill people who were against his rule. But this was really the the um, government that was supported very much by the United States and by other Allied powers. During his time in office, we also saw the rise of opposition uh, to him. So they were called the National Front. They were led by Muhammad Mozadek, and um, he's going to become a prominent leader later on. They get the support of the middle class. They're focusing on Iranian nationalism and um, opposing, you know, sort of this, this uh, di dictatorial government. In 1993, Mozadek um, started working toward a coup. So he advocated nationalizing the um, British-owned company that monopolized Iran's oil business. He was supported by the communist, by the Tuda, which was like a communist party. That's why it says communist party. Um, and he wanted to take the armed forces out from under the Shah's control. And again, the Shah is the king. So we're talking about Reza Shah. Um, so Mozadegh was elected prime minister in 1951. The prime minister position no longer exists in Iran. That was done. That has since been done away with, but it existed at, the, at this point, and he was elected to that position. So he continued to grow in power and then organized a coup and forced the Shah to flee the country in 1953. So now, <laughs> the British and the United States, again, the British and the United States supported Reza Shah. He was kind of like a puppet government for them. So they orchestrated the overthrow of Mosdek um, because, uh, for multiple reasons, one of the things is that he was supported by this communist party. You know, we're in the height of the Cold War, so really, I guess, the beginnings of the Cold War. So that's not going to sit well with the British and the United States. Also, the British did not want to nationalize the company that they owned. This, this company actually later became BP. Um, it was called the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. It later became BP. But Britain didn't want to lose control of that, and they didn't want it to become under the control of the um, government of Iran. So they, the British and the United States, orchestrated an overthrow of um, Mozadek and restored the Shah to power. So we have major interventions of the West. And this is going to be one of the things that will cause um, later leaders to really resent this Western influence. So Mohammad Reza Shah, under his leadership, he continues um, to secularize Iranian culture. This is later going to really um, have, there will be a major backlash against this leader. So in 1963, the White Revolution started, and it took away land from religious leaders and gave it to peasants. It extended women's rights. It reduced uh, the influence of religious leaders, and it increased secularism. So there were lots of things that the government did um, 
The government also bought land from owners and they gave it away to the small farmers and they um, tried to encourage entrepreneurs to create irrigation canals and dams and tractors to um, try to promote agriculture and get the land producing. While this is going on, um, the eventual uh, first general um, or supreme leader of sorry, the eventual first supreme leader of Iran after the Cultural Revolution, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, is in exile, and he starts to get word of what's going on, and he starts to speak out against the White Revolution. Under Mohammad Reza Shah, Iran is a rentier state, meaning um, they, they, have, they make a lot of money from um, payments by, from foreign governments. That's what it means to be a rentier state. So foreign governments are really supplementing the income. Iran is receiving a ridiculously high amount of income through oil. And by 1970s, most of its expenses are paid by these foreign governments who are buying Iran's oil. And they don't need to rely on internal taxes for support. That sounds really great, like that's that's fabulous that the people are not paying taxes. However, that can also be concerning because when you rely solely on this one um, economic venture, there's a lot of potential there for something to go wrong. Um, and it also calls into question the legitimacy of the um, of the government if they're not having to, um, like, like how much are they really going to listen to the citizens if the citizens aren't having to pay for the government to exist. So if the government can operate without the support of the citizens, you know, where's, where's the legitimacy there? Industrialization is a result of this oil revenue, so it allows Iran to modernize very quickly. We also continue to see centralization. So this is important because all of these things are going on. You're going to see a major backlash against these with the revolution of 1979. Um, that will bring about the Iran that we mostly know today. So this is what I just discussed in the last question. Can a government that doesn't depend upon its constituents for income really be representative or legitimate? We might talk about that in class. So keep that in mind. All right. So the Shah eventually will reach his downfall. So he becomes very wealthy and becomes more distant from the people over the years. He begins to ignore civil liberties. He stifles newspapers, political parties, and professional associations and alienates the clergy, the intelligentsia, and urbanites. So all these groups that are pretty necessary to maintain support. So um, the biggest thing, the biggest problem that Reza Shah encountered is that he really went beyond the political culture for Iran. He was perceived as being totalitarian rather than just theocratic or um, or a strong leader. He was perceived as being totalitarian. He secularized the country too fast. For many, many years, Iran had been dominated um, by religious forces. Sharia law had been um, the way of life for people. And so he's trying to secularize the, too quickly and getting rid of um, a lot of uh, a lot of the characteristics that really helped Iranians identify with who they were. He offended many nationalists and clergy um, because he had ties to the U.S. Um, and to other Western nations. In 1975, the Shah really got into trouble, and one of the things that really brought about um, some dissent toward him was that uh, he announced the formation of something called the Resurgence Party, and he declared that Iran was a one-party state, and he was in charge of it. So this all brings us to a revolution in 1979. So there were some triggers that had been building, some things that brought about um, the revolution and made 1979 the ideal time for this to happen. Oil prices had been decreasing uh, by 10%, well, whereas consumer prices had been increasing. Um, people began to expect more from their government. They were frustrated um, with the lack of, you know, what, with their government not responding to their needs. And the U.S. also began to put pressure on the Shah to loosen the restraints on opposition. So the Shah, again, he had declared Iran as a one-party state, and that was starting to be perceived negatively even by his supporters. 
The revolution of 1979 was organized and led by religious leaders, um, but it was actually very broadly supported by many sectors. The revolutionary coalition included people who were poor, especially the urban poor, um, people who were from the moderate middle classes supported the revolution. People who were uh, merchants, who were really heavily involved in the economy, they supported the revolution. The clergy, again, is the most important group involved in uh, the revolution. The revolution is led by Ayatollah Ruhala Khomeini, who had, like I said, he'd been in exile in Paris. His speeches were very influential. He'd been speaking out um, against the white revolution. He'd been speaking out against the Shah's government. Um, and he returns to Iran and leads the revolution, forcing the Shah to flee the country in February of 1979. So in 1979, we officially see the founding of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And uh, at this time, in April of 1979, the country held a national referendum. They voted out the monarchy, so they voted out the king, and they established the Islamic Republic. They came up with a new constitution. They appointed the leader of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, as the supreme leader. Islamic fundamentalism was the key um, component in the new laws. It emphasized a very literal interpretation of Islamic texts. It promoted social conservatism. It promoted traditionalism. So it was a backlash against some of these Western ideals and the secularism that we'd seen under Reza Shah. It also created the Juris Guardianship. Uh, we talked about that in class a little bit. And it gave senior clergy members or grand ayatollahs this all-encompassing authority over the whole community. So they were able to um, make major decisions about um, laws that would exist and about the way of life for people. Only these senior clerics could interpret Sharia law. This is going to feed into the fact that now the advisors who choose the supreme leader are all from this. They all are senior. Are they all are ayat? The Cultural Revolution um, is another event that happened following the Iranian Revolution. It was launched by Shia leaders, and it's trying to purify the country from everything that happened under the Shah's leadership uh, to get rid of those secular values, to get rid of Western influences. It purged universities of people who were considered liberals in suppressed opposition. So we see some similarities here. You, you know, on Friday, for Friday, you have an assignment where you're going to be comparing the revolutions in different countries. So you might think about, you know, how is this, um, how is this similar to what happened in Russia or what happened in China? Other significant events that happened, and we're not getting too, too much into this, but from 1980 to 1988, Iran and Iraq were at war with one another. Uh, it started when Iraq invaded Iran by land and by air. People, what really happened is that this solidified and legitimized the new government of Iran. People rallied around the government in response, which is typical in times of crisis. People tend to stand together. And it finally ended in 1988 when the UN brokered a ceasefire. We're not so much concerned with, you know, why this happened or what happened, but it does have an important impact because, um, it again, it, it, it brought people together behind the new government. So post Khomeini, so 1989 to the president. So the first um, Supreme Leader Khomeini died in 1989. So since then, the Supreme Leader has been Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, so the difference is the O and the A. Um, and we also have seen a change in the Constitution since then. The Constitution specifically put Khomeini, Khomeini, this Khomeini, in the position that he held for life. Um, and um, the Constitution originally said that uh, after Khomeini's death, his authority would go to a leadership council of two or three senior clerics. However, um, once Khomeini died, his followers did not trust that group of clerics, and they changed the constitution and decided to select a new supreme leader in Ali Khamenei, who was um, a cleric from the middle rank, um, someone who had just become an ayatollah, and um, who they thought you know maybe wouldn't bring about too drastic uh, of reforms. Post Khomeini, 
Um, one of the most more significant presidents right after Khomeini died was Hashimi Rafsanjani. Uh, he was a moderate. He brought about very few reforms. He was really you know, forced to deal with a slumping economy due to some of the due to the war in Iraq. From 1997 to 2005, the president was Mohammed Khatami. He was a reformist. He was uh, a surprise winner of the election. Um, he received the vote and support from women, from university students, from young adults all over the country. Um, and he brought up some pretty significant changes. He, um, one of the more significant things he did was that he censored the press less than previous leaders, and he tried to improve the relations with the United States and with other Western countries. Um, he ended up being somewhat isolated um, by a resurgence of conservatives in the country, sort of a backlash against what people perceived as his kind of liberal tendencies. And while he was in office, um, remember the general counsel has the ability to vet all candidates. One of the things that happened was that the general counsel did not allow any moderates uh, to run for the parliament in 2004 um, because they already were experiencing what they believed to be a pretty liberal president. Um, one of the more famous presidents that you've probably um, heard of is President Ahmadinejad, who was in power from 2005 to 2013. He was, uh, had been a very conservative mayor. He ended up winning the presidential election in June of 20, 2005 in a runoff vote. Um, and he became the first non-cleric president in 24 years. And this is interesting. I should make note of this. Some of you had asked about um, can you run again after you've already con served consecutive terms. And yes, you can. It's just you can't serve consecutive terms. So here we saw a former president um, running for office again. To push for Ahmadinejad to not be reelected, there is a reformist candidate named Musavi who ran for office. Um, the race was very close. About 85% of the people voted in the election. Um, at the time of the election, allegations of fraud were very strong. and Musavi urged his supporters to the streets. And actually, um, the Iranian government ended up reporting that in 50 areas, more votes were counted than there were eligible voters. So the evidence of electoral fraud in this particular election were really, it was irrefutable. Um, the government itself acknowledged that three million ballots were stuffed. Uh, lots of evidence suggests that it was even higher than this. So the interesting thing, though, is that uh, Khamenei, the supreme leader, agreed to an investigation, but ultimately declared the vote legitimate. So he stepped in and pushed for Ahmadinejad to keep, you know, ultimately Ahmadinejad won the election. So this led to huge protests, um, and the government had to crack down on these protests. They limited civil liberties. What we're going to see for from Ahmadinejad in the years following is an in, immense crackdown on civil rights and civil liberties. This is something I would be very... Um, I would say that you might see something like this on the AP test. You know, why did people protest after the 2009 election? And it's because the claims of... Um, of electoral fraud were pretty indisputable. All right, there's a long list here about President Ahmadinejad, and what we need to know is just the general themes here. I don't expect you to know this whole huge list of things that he did. But there are a lot of reforms he made that really limited civil rights and civil liberties. So what you started to see under his leadership was that the Council of Guardians began to reject the candidacies of anybody who was a reformer, anybody who tried to go against his government. We saw further restrictions on public freedom. We saw journalists and people who were active in civil society arrested. We saw internet users, so people who Ahmadinejad claimed were trying to spread information aimed at disturbing the public mind um, could be arrested. 
people, you know, so this is, again, an intense backlash against the secularization that we saw under Reza Shah. And we saw the development of morality police and vigilantes to enforce Islamic dress codes, prevent public mingling of men and women. There are increasing reports of arrest and torture and executions. Sharia law is more strictly enforced. And they called for the destruction of Israel and questioned the reality of the Holocaust. So there's lots of things going on here, and all of this is sort of being promoted in Iran. In 2013, when Ahmadinejad's rule ended, when his time in office was up, oh, he also increased nuclear fuel research. Now the current president is President Rouhani, who was elected in 2013. He's a more moderate cleric, so Ahmadinejad gets this sort of reputation for all of these things that happened here, whereas Rouhani has been much more moderate, you know, in context. Okay, I'm going to post for you on Canvas the John Green video about Iran's revolutions. I highly recommend it. Um, if you want to go back through and, and see um, just kind of an overview of everything I just talked about. And um, if you have questions, please write them down for us to go over. Thanks for listening, and I hope you prepare well for your quiz.